So we post all of our, uh, our stuff up on GitHub. So we've got a bunch of starter kits up there. You scroll down, we have starter kits for Windows and for Windows Phone, and we're, we're actually expanding this list. So everything you see here is being ported over to phone. But we've got Active Access, a Chuck Norris starter kit, Earthquakes and Bing Maps, Edmonds, Facebook, Foursquare, Instagram, Meetup, Messier Sky Objects, Rotten Tomatoes, Stack Exchange, Tumblr, Twitter, Univision, Wikipedia, World of Warcraft, Yelp, and ESPN. So that's all of these are all functional Windows 8 apps with the code and everything I showed you, that's the pattern they're all using. That whole open data API call, deserialize, bind to the UI. If you're interested in seeing how you get started building for Windows 8 and for Windows Phone, these are fantastic resources here, all built by my team. So uh, it's all free, it's up on GitHub. The way to do it, you just go to that site and click the download zip file. So we also include um, a lab workbook. There's three lab workbooks in there to just kind of take you through how to get started with this stuff. All right. So wanted to make sure you were aware of that. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bob. We've been deep posted at cs76.net, a instructions for how you can get access to a DreamSpark account. So after Beautiful. tonight, you can get that, and then we'll post the slides later tonight. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Why don't we go ahead and take a few minute break here while Dan gets set up, and then we'll transition to the third and final platform for the evening, Android. All right, so we are back. So the third act here is Dan Armendaris, who actually started this class several years ago. So the origins of uh, S76 can be tra uh, traced back to him and a colleague of his. And it was uh, I who came along a year or so after that that I finally got involved. So everything you've seen thus far is all traced back to Dan. So Dan's going to take a look at Android development with us. And without further ado, Dan Armendaris. Thanks. Hi everyone, it's nice to be back, so to speak, even though in the context, in, from where you're sitting, it doesn't really seem that way. Uh, the class was very different back then, just like mobile development has really evolved over the years. In fact, in the past year, since the last time that I actually um, co-taught this class with David, Android development has gotten a lot better, in, at least in the initial setup. And so we're going to talk about, as quickly as we can, we're going to try to shoehorn what I used to put four weeks worth of content into one hour. Um, so please allow me some leeway as I go a little quickly through some things. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt at any time. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to um, get you guys comfortable in such a way that you'll be able to do some Android development as soon as you go home. So just so that I can sort of get a sense of where everybody is, how many of you use an iOS device as your, say, primary phone, an iPhone? That's just about everybody. Now, is, are there any of you that use an Android device as your primary phone? OK. So for those of you that, that have your hands up, is that constant? Do you always use that um, device rather than an iOS device? All right, so for those of you that had your hands up, you probably are familiar with the, di the differences between the experience of an Android device and an iOS device. And this is actually really important, is that in order to develop on one of these platforms, um, it really is useful to have a sense of what that platform is actually like to be able to use it. And so if you are serious about actually doing cross-platform work, just to reiterate comments um, that, that Bob made in the first hour, it's really helpful to get a sense of that experience and how you will actually want to replicate that on, on this other device. And even though Android is considered to be the primary competitor to iOS, it's really difficult to put them, I think, on that same sort of comparison. They operate in very different ways. They have very different uh, reasonings behind di very different decisions that went into their implementation. And there's a lot of maybe, uh, let's see, what is the, the proper word to use here? There's perhaps a lot of difference between the, the two that, and a lot of confusion between the two that really just arise from these sort of basic differences, these basic differences that, that arose initially from when Google was first started developing Android and when um, Apple first started developing iPhone and iOS. Um, so this is actually pretty important for us as well as developers. So for, th for, for us as developers, 
what are some of the differences that we typically hear about the um, uh, about developing for iOS versus developing for Android? If you were to go out onto a tech blog and read the the comments that people always post whenever Apple or whenever Google updates one of their hardware devices, people always complain about the same sorts of things, right? What are these differences? What do Android users dislike about iPhones, and what do iPhone users dislike about Android? Any ideas? Yeah. So perhaps if I could summarize that in, in a way to say that people consider Android to be a little bit more open than iOS. Um, and so that is, that is certainly true in many respects, even for us as developers. Um, when you create a developer account with Google, you pay a one-time $25 fee. You have an account with them. Basically, that $25 fee is to weed out people that just want to create, you know, flood the, the store with spam. It's not, a, it's not a terribly high fee, but it is one fee that you have to do. But then after that, you are free to submit your applications to the store. There's no review process. Um, and you basically create your, your application, you publish it to the store, and then that's it. It's up and ready for people to download. That's just one sense that um, Google might be a little bit more open than Apple. Um, but there's other ways as well. You have a little bit more control over your phone, some people would argue, a little bit more customization. Whereas in iOS, they try to really funnel you towards a certain type of experience, which in itself, I'm framing it not in the sense that this is a negative, but in fact that it's a very, again, a very different way of thinking about this. Google allows you to have a lot more options. And so it can, to people who are not familiar with the system, appear to be a little bit more complex. And so again, this is just that same sort of idea that we want to point out, the differences between the two. Did you have a, a question or a difference? So um, for the longest time, Android was open source, but they have, in fact, closed sourced some of them. So a lot of the code is, in fact, open source, but I think a lot of, some of the now more basic functions are, in fact, closed source um, from Google. But yeah, that was also a primary difference between Apple and, and, and Android. Again, part we could perhaps uh, include this within this openness aspect. What about other things? Anything else as developers that might be different? Yes. Right, so there's, this is definitely a big one that we hear a lot, is that this fragmentation in Android devices. And in fact, this is a very important point that I want to bring up right away, is that um, there is some truth to this in, in what is actually fragmented. There are many different types of hardware devices available for, uh, for with the Google operating system, with the Android operating system, from different manufacturers, whereas Apple only is the only manufacturer of, the, of iPhone and iPad. There are many different manufacturers that use Android as a, as a platform. And even within that context, many people don't update their software as much as we as developers might want them to. And there's a variety of reasons for this. Some of them may not be aware that there's an update. Some of them, um, but I think one of the, the, the more pressing problems is that with many of the third-party phones that come out, that have Android on them, they add a lot of stuff to it. Sort of like when you buy a, a PC and it has a lot of stuff installed. And my friend just bought an Asus, and he said that it had like a, oh my gosh, I wish I could remember exactly what it was, but it was like an Asus internet connection help wizard or some sort of very specific thing that he was kind of surprised that they actually bothered. This one hardware company actually bothered to create the software for it. And it's sort of a similar thing. A lot of these companies will, in fact, add their own additional UI components on top of the Android base OS, which further adds to perhaps some of the confusion between different users. When you pick up an Android device from, say, Samsung versus one that Google uh, created with just the base Android OS, it might actually look different, even though it has the same version of the OS because of this, these additional little flares and additional pieces of software that they will actually add on to this. Now, I don't want to confuse the issue. All of that stuff aside, the, one of the base issues in this fragmentation argument is the, vi the, just the wide range of versions that are installed on hardware devices right now. So this is a chart that Google actually created. They release a similar chart every half month or every month or so, showing the distribution of devices that connect to the Google Play Store, which is the equivalent of, of the App Store on, um, on iOS. And as we can see here, 
there's really no one slice of this pie that makes up the majority of the devices. It really runs the gamut from Gingerbread, right here, which is a version 2 of Android OS, which is now several years old, all the way up to Jelly Bean, which is one of the later versions, version 4.1 and 4.2. And now there's an even newer version, 4.3, but I'm not sure that any devices have been released that actually have that or that it's actually been released at this point. Um, now, sort of the saving grace here with this is that if you did want to uh, target a lot of these users, you can actually create, of course, an application that is targeted at one of these APIs, one of these earlier APIs, and be able to get a large portion of the market. Um, and by the market, I mean the available market for your application. Of course, if you wanted to use some API that's only available in some later version of the OS, then you will perhaps limit yourself in terms of the market that is available for that. But the Android OS isn't the only reason why this, this, in, why, um, this system might be considered fragmented. We also 